be co-presenters. So we've got Larry and Greg, and I will let them take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. As you can see, I'm going to talk about dipoles. Everybody's talked about dipoles, but we're going to keep it simple. Can you speak up just a little bit? More? More. More. Where's my microphone? <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, dipoles are real simple to build, simple to tune, and pretty easy to put up depending on what your situation is. I've used dipoles in my whole Mediterranean over here. I've used them mostly in a format called inverted V, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But anyway, as we're going on, dipole is nothing more than a half length. We've talked about that numerous times today already, so I don't think we need to go into that too much. Different types of dipoles. In the upper left, you have a horizontal configured dipole. It takes basically three points to support it. If you want to support it decently, you can get away with two. You have the inverted V. Basically, you have a single point of support, and also you don't need the length of real estate to put it in because it's going to be somewhat smaller footprint. We have what's called the sloping dipole, and that again is another dipole just put up in a different fashion. Then you have the fan dipole. It's a multi-band dipole. It's self-switching from band to band. It takes a little bit more to construct, a little bit more to tune, but it's fully functional. For that matter, I have used fan dipoles numerous times. Currently, I have a fan dipole in my attic. It works well, and I have worked more. Then we get to a little more complicated one that Warren told me about a while back called the cage dipole. The advantage of the cage dipole is it becomes broader band. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go. Then you've got the inverted L, and it can be the radiator vertical, and you have the ground plate on the, bottom, on the bottom, or as shown in the, the picture here. <clears throat> wires. What kind of wire are you going to use for a dipole? Well, you can use copper. Like you can buy for just household wiring and stuff like that. The problem with that is it's soft. It will stretch. You'll have to maintain it. Depending on the circumstances, it may not be the best to use. In most cases, it isn't the best to use because it can break. Then you have hard-drawn copper. It's, a it's just a different way of milling the copper. Then we have what's called copper kit, copper clad. It's basically steel wire, copper on the surface. As was mentioned previously in some of the uh, presentations, your electrons run on the surface of the copper. It doesn't run on the metal, so you're running on the copper and not in the steel. You have stranded copper. <clears throat> I've used some of that. It's, kind of, it's basically a copper clad in a strand. That gets pretty tough to work with, especially when it pierces your fingers as you're trying to bend it and work with it. Because it's fine, finer strands. It's strong, it radiates well. I've used it for outdoor antennas many, many years ago. The gauge of the wire that you want to use, the bigger the wire, Broader the, the broader the band of that wire, just like in the cage dipole, you get a broader band to work with. You get a little more strength, but you get a little more weight. If you want to use insulated wire, I use insulated household wire. As a matter of fact, my dipoles in the attic are insulated wire. The, what happens though with that is you change the velocity factor of, of the wire itself. So it gets a little more tricky when you're trying to figure the calculations to figure the, the length of your dipoles. Insulators. There are multiple types of insulators that can be used. This, this one here is called the dog bone. It's many times used for the center of a dipole because you've got the ribs in here where you can run your coax over and then your tube 
type of legs. That works fine for that. I've used it in various situations, including end insulators. The problem though with using it as an end insulator is if it should break, your antenna will come down. Then they have the eggshell insulator, which the wire runs around this way and this way. If the insulator breaks, your antenna stays up. So there's different kinds of insulators you can use on your dipoles. How long do you cut your legs? This formula here works pretty well. I got it out of the WRL antenna book, which I have found to be a pretty good binder when it comes to antennas. It can be used very in-depth, or it can be used for basic stuff. Uh, you know, move down here and dip into it. Anyway, um, the formula here is you take, they recommend taking 490 divided by the frequency and adding a little bit on each end for your light cuts. And then you use the second formula, and that lets you find out what your, um, your original frequency is, and that's what you want to target for. You have your measure frequency, which you will use find by using an antenna analyzer or calculating your point of middle of SWR. And then you plug in the numbers, and it comes out with what your actual length should be. You take the difference, take that, and half of that difference you take off each end. Now one of the things that I've learned is a trick with, with antenna tuning. Let's see if I can get it here real quick. You, you've got, you can just take your length and wrap it back on your, on itself. <clears throat> As you do this, you should you can literally shorten the antenna. The extra length that's wrapped back does not affect the antenna itself, but will give you the correct length. If you get too short, you can just unwrap part of it and create a pigtail. You know, it'll give you your extra length on your antenna that you may need for tuning. It's a trick I learned a while back. I looked at it and I said, well, does that really work? I played with it. It works great. And it saves you a lot of time in trying to wrap and unwrap and measure and unmeasure or cut, lengthen, whatever. <clears throat> Here we have my antenna analyzer <clears throat> set up for the three lengths of my fan dipole in my attic. that I have a rather high SWR, but it's also a 28190, 28 I think it is, which is not really where you want it to be. But I also found that at that point, my impedance is 50 ohms. My, my antenna tuner works fine with this. It, it tweaks it for me, and I've had no problems. The next one here, Thank you. Um, the one in the middle is for 15 meters. That comes out of 2106, which isn't too far off. It's, in, it's basically, uh, again, a little bit more 50 ohms, a little bit better than 50 ohms, but my SWR is done like 1.5. And, and then the one on the right side is for uh, 20 meters, and that one is like a 1.5. SWR even also. And so that's all done with my antenna tuner. It compensates for it. I've also been able to run other bands off of these legs through the, through the tuner itself. <clears throat> we talked about different balance and things. You can get commercially built balance, which I have one here. 
runs everywhere from the 160 BM through six meters. And it's a real true balance with ferrite core, core and everything else. And this is one that I really like to be using, but uh, I've had, I have a little situation going on where my wife doesn't like me crawling up in the attic anymore, so I've not been able to change this one out. <laughs> I've also got the ugly battle, which is really a choke. I've built numerous of these. The first one I built was on a Clorox white bottle. Instead of going out and buying PVC pipe, which they hold like four or five feet of, and I only needed you know, whatever this length is, eight inches maybe, I used that. That's the one that's currently in my attic working with the Van Dyke home. I then got this crazy idea. The diameter is about right. How about a peanut butter jar? A little more rigidity gives me better capability of doing stuff and not so flimsy. And if I ever decide to go out in the field and carry things along with me, I got a little storage <laughs> bag. some bolts. <laughs> Whatever it takes, yes. And so I've built a number of these. They've all worked pretty well. Again, they're not a real valve. They're a choke. It, years ago, and I don't even remember what, if this is a voltage or current valve, but this is the first one I ever bought many, many years ago. It was called the IQ Allen from a company in Ohio, which doesn't exist anymore. It's basically all built within PVC pipe and everything. And since I wanted to change antenna legs on it all the time, I just put pigtails on it and screw and so I could put the little eyelets on it, put the wire on it, and done with it. The advantage with using any of these is you pretty much keep RF from coming back into your shack, which uh, Lloyd said he had experience with, and I do believe many years ago I did too, with the microphone. <coughs> what do you feed a balance, or, or I should say a dipole with? You can use lack of line. That works great, but you got to be out in free space. You can't run it inside walls or anything like that. So that kind of got ruled out in my case, so I started using right right coax. Coax basically can be run in most any place. But you have to be careful with what you're going to use. Uh, Bob's touched on it as far as the different types. 50, RG58, ADX, A, all, all the other ones that are available. Because you have to be concerned about the length and the frequency and the power. So you have to take all of those into consideration. For what I do, I use a lot of our G8X. It's easy to work with, my runs are short, and I'm not using a lot of power, and I keep things lower frequencies, the more in the HF world. There is, somehow I overlocked it. I don't know how that happened. I thought I had fixed it. But anyway, there's on the slides, there are two locations. There's one on the previous slide for balance that MFJ has a bunch of that you can go and look at. EX Engineering has a lot of balance too, and that's where I got the commercial one from. And then on the bottom here, this is allbands.com. They got a lot of information there related to different types and uses of COMAX. Any questions? Afterwards, I will be putting it together outside a uh, inverted V and playing with the antenna analyzer. If anybody cares to join later on, to, to see how you kind of work with that stuff. So I saw one here. Yes. Um, just to add to what you're adding on to the dipole. Back in the day, in the 70s, when I was had my first antenna, I was introduced to this piece of equipment, instead of cutting the coax and separating the mm -hmm. wires, because we all know that water contamination is a no-no, and I just remember what that piece was called. It's an HQ-1. It's a um, female um, connection that 
it's encased in really hard plastic, and these people are still manufacturing this. And basically, you get your RG58, your male connector, stick that in there, twist it down, and then just solder your two end die poles. Um, I like it because I hung an 80 meter die pole across my father's house, 40 feet in the air, and with all the winds in Minnesota and 30, 40 below, and windshield factor 80 to 100 below, that plastic would not break. And here's the piece right here, if you'd like to look at it. You don't have to cut your, your uh, cable anymore. Just handsomely solder a, a metal connector, put it in there, and it has a drip plate, and it seals it off, and you won't contaminate your, your feet on it. into uh, infant uh, wire antennas. W one of the things that you notice when you're talking about the dipole is really if you want to have a flat top dipole, you're best off if you have three supports, one on each end and one in the middle. Um, and for a lot of people, it's inconvenient to have those three supports or to have that middle of your dipole be right outside your shack so that you can get to and so you end up with a long run of coax to get to it. So a good solution sometimes is to think about an in-fed wire antenna. Uh, I did make some just general notes that we've already dealt with on wire. Um, they have physical properties as well as electrical properties, and you want to avoid having them stretch out so you gotta retune them. You wanna keep them in the air so you want a strong antenna. Uh, Anything that's going to touch anything, you're better off if it's insulated, of course. Uh, anything that is not going to be touching anything can be bare. Uh, heavier gauge is better, it makes for a wider band width uh, for your antenna. If you use a lighter gauge uh, wire, uh, it's not going to be as wide of uh, an antenna for you. Uh, so, anyway, I will spin them off. Any conductor will work at any frequency. You want to build one that radiates more than it converts you into uh, heat. Um, anyway, you can read all that. Uh, when it comes time to cutting the wire, whether it's for the uh, infants or the dipoles, there are many factors that weigh into how long your wire needs to be. So when you go in and you look at the antenna book or you look at your um, test prep materials and it tells you oh divide by 468 or divide by 490 or whatever it is there are assumptions that go into that and so part of how long that wire needs to be is determined by kind of up front, proximity to other objects whether it's insulated what the gauge is what type of metals in the wire whether it's bra braided twisted or a solid conductor um, and then, kind of last but not least, anything in the near field, which Laura talked about near field today, can affect the way your antenna resonates, and it can also affect the, the radiation pattern and the length of the wire that you need for your antenna. That being said, there are three 
uh, basic, simple, in-fed wire antennas. Uh, one that you hear a little bit about, and in fact, uh, an antenna that Daryl and I have talked about, is a double in-fed zap, which is set up kind of like a dipole, where you have another leg going the other direction, fed with lateral line, two to 50 ohms, so that uh, it'll feed correctly. The problem with uh, the double in-fed zap and with this one is it needs to be high. And so you, it wants to be at 67 feet off the ground, and that may be about uh, beyond your reach. Uh, a second type is uh, an in-fed halfway. Now this is a little bit of a complicated diagram of an in-fed halfway. But the idea is that you have a fundamental frequency at which the wire is essentially one half wavelength and length. And I will say that with the caveat that it sometimes makes sense even if you have the room to have a shorter antenna wire at the fundamental frequency and to insert an inductor. And the reason why is because this antenna will not only be resonant on the fundamental frequency, it will also resonate on the harmonics of the fundamental frequency. And the problem is if you put a full length wire up half wave on 80 meters, you start running the harmonics, the harmonics end up being out of band on the higher bands. If you use a shorter um, wire with an inductor in it, you can get it so that it'll resonate in band at the higher bands. Because the inductor affects the lower bands more than it affects the higher bands for some electrical reasons. Well, I'm not sure actually. In any event, uh, one thing that you'll want to do with uh, this infant half wave is have a common mode choke. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and then there's something that I call a non resonant infed. Um, I think Steve will talk about that when he talks about soda antennas. And the slick thing about that is you're using what we, la what we call a random wire. It's not a random length, but we call it a random wire or a long wire. And the idea is you don't want it to be resonant on any frequency. And then you feed it through uh, an unit at a 9 to 1 transformer because the impedance of that infed half wave, or at, excuse me, of that infed random wire is only about 450 to 1. So that uh, with a 9 to 1, you can drop it right into 50 ohm to match your impedance. So, um, an in-fed antenna, everybody thinks, well, it's just that long wire. It's really more than that because you need to work it against ground. You're either going to have a counterpoise or you're going to have it coming back down and working part of your coax as part of the antenna system itself in addition to being part of the feed line system. Um, you need to have return of current to make any antenna really work. As Bob pointed out, you know, a lot of times you'll put like a vertical, you'll put it on a, on a ground plane or you'll, you'll put radials out below it, either tuned radials at an elevation or ground radials that aren't tuned right on the ground. Um, but with an infed antenna, you're going to have to have a place to, for that antenna to work against the ground. And you'll either go with, like I said, a ground wire, um, what do you call it, um, a counterpoise, or you come back down some of your coax. And when it comes down to coax, it's going to go right back into your shack unless you can isolate that to keep it out of the shack. And I would recommend doing that. You'll put a, a choke on it to prevent that from happening. So the infant uh, halfway of zap, as you can see here, is fed with ladder line. And then the ladder line, it, it shorted across the bottom, and then up above that, you'll find the 50 meter feed line point, and that's where you'll feed it. You'll run your coax, will feed there, and that's how this antenna works. It's a pretty slick antenna. The infed half wave, like I said, we talked about, works on the fundamental frequency and all the harmonics. The beauty of that is that if you get one that you buy from a manufacturer and it's already tuned, you won't need a separate tuner. And so uh, maybe Steve will talk about this in his talk about soda and coat antennas, but a lot of the lower end um, 
inexpensive, maybe a CW rig that you would use for CW uh, uh, protosoda activations. They don't have a built-in tuner, like the 705, doesn't have a built-in tuner. So, so it wants a resonant frequency so that it can transmit. So you can use an in-fed half wave with that. Now, if this is a voltage-fed antenna, and it needs a matching transformer because the input impedance is a few thousand ohms. And to match that, you'll use a, a matching unit transformer, an unun, that is either somewhere between 49 to 1 and 64 to 1, depending on which wave, uh, which bands you want to work. Most of the commercial ones are coming out at 49 to 1. Uh, I would put a feed line choke on it. Be careful, there are high voltages associated with these, so they can be dangerous. You want to keep the ends away from kids, pets, neighbors, find them on the um, If you're going to run power, the transformer can get hot. Make sure your transformer is designed to handle the output of your um, station. So if you're going to want to run a kilowatt and a half on an inside half wave or that of any type, you're going to want to make sure that it's rated for that kind of voltage. Uh, and then I still recommend get a good antenna tuner because it'll bring uh, marginal conditions into a good match and knock down the SWR and you'll get a, a little better output. Uh, so we talked about it, it'll run 1800 to 13. Uh, 3,600 ohms, that's why you uh, want to use that transformer on it uh, at 40 to 1. Um, so, you know, I think that kind of covered that. Anybody have any questions about that? Yes, sir. When you should have a tape on a run one balance, what's the difference between that and a, an antenna to you know, or the, you know, different ends of the spectrum? as far as the rest of you are on the dipole. Well, if you're talking about like a current choke or voltage balance or current balance, that's not really designed to tune okay. to match the impedance. It's trying to knock off that common mode current okay. to, to avoid having the antenna radiating down your, your feed line or, your, or picking up signals and trying to run it through your shaft. Now, the final question, if you had a 20 meter dipole with an antenna to it, could you run a one-to-one -one SWR while you're on 10 or 15 meters? Well, it'll run on the harmonics and your tuner will bring it in uh, depending on the type of, in, of antenna tuner you have. Okay. It might be able to tune that. A lot of the rigs have an internal uh, tuner, but they'll only handle a three-to-one SWR. Uh, some of the other rigs will handle 10 to 1, um, and, and some of the external tuners that you can buy will handle 10 to 1. So it depends on how bad the mismatch is. Okay, so then you would uh, say get traps for your dipole for the 10, 15. Well, you can do traps on the dipole, or you can do, um, you know, they, they have, um, you can do link dipoles where you take the links out. Um, you know, there's ones where you can put, like, uh, I think there's like a little inductor that'll cut it off. Yeah. So th there's different ways to do that. But, but when you're talking about these infinite half waves in particular, uh, like on mine on 80 meters, I've got, um, and I can't remember how many Henry's it is, but a little inductor. And what that does is it makes the antenna appear electrically longer than it really is. So that when I'm working in the uh, harmonics, it drops me into band on the harmonic frequencies. So how long is it? Um, I think it's uh, it's a half wave. I think it's six to seven feet. I can't remember. Okay, it's not cuts it down. I can't remember. Um, Forty-nine to one transfer. When we talked about that. Um, if you're going to use toroids, uh, use the bigger toroids. You want to build these things so they can handle a little bit more power. An FT24043 is typically what you get used. Uh, it's a ferrite toroid, which is the FT2.4 uh, outer diameter, a mix 43. You guys probably talked about mixes in your ferrites. Uh, 31s and 43s are good in the HF frequencies. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I've got an 
right next to the bell. Should yeah. I have one down by my... Well, this is a transformer, and the transformer goes right at the feed port. And that's where you put the toroid. Uh, the, the, the toroid's inside that box. Okay. In the, in the wired as a transformer. Barry, do you have a question? Okay. Uh, the non-resident infant is kind of a fun antenna, and it works really well if you have an antenna, a radio that has an internal tuner that will tune really well. And so, like, if you have like a KX2 or a KX3, you can take them to do a soda activation. You bring one wire. And then you can run many different bands. It's a, a very slick way to go. Uh, you do need a tuner. It has wide bandwidth. Um, like, like the infant half-wave, the coax will radiate if you don't have a kind of poise or a ground. There are lower voltages involved, and there's a lower input impedance, and you normally use a 9 to 1 on on as the transformer of the feed point. Um, I built them, I, I think that uh, Steve uh, sent me a, a wiring diagram to build a little line to one transformer. It's kind of a fun little project, put in a little two by two by one uh, plastic box. Um, now, wire links, you notice how we, we, it's called a random wire, but it's not really random. And these are the, the links where it's not resonant on any frequency, which is an odd thing to wrap your head around. For a random wire antenna, you don't want it to be resonant. And you, you can get by with a slightly shorter wire than you could with an in-fed half wave or a dipole. Uh, once again, on the non-resonant, the feed point being slower, um, you need a ground or kind of place. Uh, this is a, an example of how much shorter your wire can be to work bands that you didn't think you might be able to work. So you could use a random wire at 130, uh, 130 feet of coax, but you might be able to work 160 on a 135 foot wire. Well, that might be achievable for you on a residential lot where you live if you can get a wire antenna. Uh, just for grins, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You can, there are free. Um, antenna modeling software kits on, your, on uh, the internet, uh, and you will see um, that they will generate these charts. Uh, this is a radiation chart which shows uh, how the antenna radiates, and it up is vertical, is, is above you, okay? This is an 80 meter infant half wave. 40 feet, I think, is what it said above real ground. Real ground meaning it's not um, you know, an isotropic antenna that you are using a whole bunch of assumptions to get. On 80 meters, because it's only 40 feet above the ground, it radiates straight up. When you get to 40 meter, which is the second harmonic of 80 meters, you can see that you get kind of a, a dipole configuration. Um, and then when you go to the third harmonic, 30, you get, a, you get a little bit more of a vertical up and you get uh, some definite nulls in the upper direction. But this is how it looks with that modeling software. It's pretty slick. It, it's kind of odd. See the deep nulls going out the side on 30 meters? You can work 30 meters, but you might be trying to work someone who is in a null and you won't hit them. And the other thing that's kind of interesting is it does have a little bit of an end fire to it. Now in the higher bands, you get a little different radiation um, look to them. And I think the radiation is the, the red one, and the blue one is the takeoff angle. Uh, and you can see that when you get to 10 meters, uh, which is the eighth harmonic of 80 meters, that you get a really low takeoff angle. It looks like it's around 20 degrees. But there's also a lot of nulls in there, which they aren't very deep, so on uh, 10 meters, it's not a bad. This is how it looks with the modeling software. See how pronounced the end fire is? Uh, takeaways from end feds. Uh, any matching system. 9 to 1 on a random wire. 49 to 1 on an end fed halfway. Uh, 
I would isolate to get rid of the common mode current. Uh, if you can put an isol a line isolator on. Uh, you want that to be some distance from the feed point. Uh, I would say the minimum is about 0.05 wavelengths away. So take your 0.05 wavelengths times your fundamental frequency, and that's how far down you'd be. I, I would spend a lot of time on the math. I would just move it away from the feed point and closer to your shack. Uh, you can uh, use the coax as a counterpoise, or you can use a real counterpoise, or you can add a ground wire. Uh, it's easy to experiment with those. I would just play with them. You can use a line isolator between your feed line and your rig to knock off all that common mode current. That works fine. The manufacturers sell those all day long. Uh, watch out if you're going to be running high power because the transformers aren't all built to handle that. They won't get hot. Um, and the random wire works great for soda poda. Uh, ARL has an infant half wave kit. I was going to surprise the ARL decided it was going to compete with its advertisers. But it decided to do that last year, and so you can buy it for $69. You have to wrap your own tour, and it's kind of a fun thing. That's it. Any questions? Uh, yes, sir. If you're using the uh, coax uh, for your counterpoise on an infinite half wave, practically, how do you get the length just right? Uh, you don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> you want it to be. Uh, long enough so that it'll work as a counterpoise and frequency are going to be running. Typically, guys run them about 30 feet at least. 30? Yeah, and then if it's longer, it's okay. And then I would put either ferrite beads on it or a line isolator on it when it enters the shack or gets to your rig. Um, is there a question over here? Yes, sir. Can you go back to the uh, minimal color and range? Uh, well, that's kind of funny. Yeah, so that explains to me. It has an amplifier characteristic to it. So those low uh, angles. It's kind of weird because when you really get into it, if you look at it long enough, you will see like a dipole, you know how a dipole has those two big lobes? Well, you're starting to stack up dipoles in, you know, and so you end up with all these different lobes based on it being a half wave at that new frequency. And so you end up with, you know, like eight, there's eight lobes here because you're working the eighth harmonic. To go back to the previous It does, and, and it's got a certain amount of directivity to it, a little bit of gain. Um, but there are some nulls. The nulls aren't very deep. You look over here at the 20 meter, look how much deeper those nulls are. I mean, I guess not that much deeper. But, but there, it is possible to be trying to work someone in a null, and you just don't get them if you have a fixed antenna. So for me, what I do is I have two infed half waves, uh, one at one orientation and one at a different orientation, and then I can just switch if I'm having a hard time working something, or if there's an, er an area where I want to work that I have Any other questions? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Right. How does that affect the radiation pattern? Uh, you know, I honestly don't know how to fix the radiation pattern. Um, on some levels, an infed half wave is like an off center fed. It's just fed so far off that it's in the air. Anybody else? All right, I think we should take a short break and then come back in five and. <laughs>